Coming to you from deep within the Command Valley, my name is Griffin and welcome to another Monday Deck Tech. Before I continue, I just wanted to let you guys know that the newest episode of Duel of the Peaks is up right now. Go ahead and click on the link up in the corner to go watch it. It's a super fun game. And I also wanted to announce right here, right now, that next month, the next gameplay is going to be themed around the tribes. And the reason why I say that is because I am doing a deck tech on the deck that I am playing on that game. So if you haven't already, please go ahead and check out the two episode of Duel of the Peaks that are out right now. We'll link them either in the show notes or on the video screen for you. Uh, but yeah, please go check them out. And without further ado, let's go ahead and move on to the deck tech. So while trying to choose the tribe for my deck that I'm playing on the next Duel of the Peaks, I thought, hmm, what tribe would best represent me as a Magic player? And no tribe represents me better than the tribe of vampires. And no commander represents the vampires better than the father of them all, Edgar Markov. Edgar Markov is 3 red, white, black for a 4-4 legendary creature vampire knight. He has the eminence effect, which means that as long as it's in the command zone or on the battlefield, this effect will take place. Saying whenever you cast another vampire spell, if Edgar Markov is in the command zone or on the battlefield, create a 1-1 black vampire creature token. He has first strike and haste, and whenever Edgar Markov attacks, put a plus one plus one counter on each vampire you control. So going through the six-fold path of how to build a commander deck, for the first one we have our commander Edgar Markov. For the second step in our six-fold path is, what's the strategy? How are we going to win? And with Edgar Markov, we've built a very aggro-esque, power out very quickly strategy. So with Edgar Markov, we want to play as many vampires as we can. We want to play anthem effects on our vampires and just have a lot of synergy when it comes to our vampires. Now for the third step in how to build a commander deck, how are we going to get there? So in this deck, I'm going to go ahead and just go through because this is a vampire deck and a lot of them look over. I'm going to go through the curve with you guys because this is very important in this deck. So the most important things that we could be playing on this deck are cheap vampires. And a lot of them may not be very good, but the fact that they're a vampire and they're getting us a token from Edgar Markov every time we cast one, that means we're just doubling up on our vampires. Before I go ahead and go into the vampires, I wanted to talk about the curve of this deck. Now, Edgar Markov is Mardu colors, uh, black, red, and white. Now, for this deck and the way I've built it, I have very minimal red in this deck. This is more of a black, white, splashing red for a couple of cards. That is the way I have built it. That's the way I found it to be most optimal. If you want to put more red uh, spells and vampires in it, then absolutely go ahead. This is just the take that I've made on it. So first off, let's talk about the one drop vampires in this deck, beginning with Quag Vampires, Shadow Ali Denizen, Stormkirk Noble, Vampire Cutthroat, Vampire of the Dire Moon, and Vicious Conquistador. These are all small one mana vampires that do different effects. Ones like Shadow Ali Denizen and Stormkirk Noble can give you extra advantage on when you're casting creatures. And the rest of them are just one mana vampires that have a little bit of extra effect to them so that we can get as much as we can from our one mana vampires. The best card in our one mana slot is Indulgent Aristocrat, which I want to spend a little bit more time on. Indulgent Aristocrat is one black for a 1-1 one, one vampire with lifelink, and for two generic mana you can sacrifice a creature and put a plus one plus one counter on each vampire you control. These kind of cards, like Indulgent Aristocrat, are the type of cards that we want on the battlefield because by making so many vampire tokens, we're going to be able to sacrifice them to just give more counters to all the rest of our vampires. So this is why this is going to be the all-star in our, our one slot. This is something that we want to have out, want to have a lot of vampires so that we can use the aristocrat style strategy to pump up our team and and aggro our opponents out in our two drop slot we have cruel celebrant dusk legion zealot gifted aetherborn legion lieutenant olivia's blood swarm vampire hex mage again we're just putting as many vampires as we can into this cards like legion lieutenant olivia's blood sworn and cruel celebrant give us a little bit of extra effects with legion lieutenant pumping our team cruel celebrant having a draining effect stapled onto her and olivia's blood swarm allowing us to give our creatures haste if we need to the all-star in the two mana slot is going to be cordial vampire from modern horizons cordial vampire is one black one black for a 1-1 one, one creature vampire, whenever Cordial Vampire or another creature dies, put a plus one plus one counter on each vampire you control. Cordial Vampire is potentially one of the best cards in this deck. Because something that I missed when I first read this is that Cordial Vampire counts it and every other creature, not just yours. Whenever another creature dies, it's going to put a plus one plus one counter on each vampire you control, which means you don't have to sacrifice your vampires to get that effect. By just removing your opponent's creatures and using your aggro strategy, you're getting advantage off of that just by removing people's creatures. 
In our three drop slot, we have a lot more spicy things. We have Forerunner of the Legion, which, which is two and white, which can tutor a vampire from our deck and also give us some extra advantage off of our vampires. Mavern Frayne, Dusk Apostle, which gives us vampires when we attack with our vampires. Pot of Ulamog, which is a vampire that allows us to get Eldrazi spawn when our non-token creature dies. Rakish Air, which is two in red for a 2-2 vampire, which gives us plus one, plus one counters on our vampires when they deal combat damage. Stormcur Captain, one black red for a first strike 2-2 vampire soldier that gives all of our other vampires plus one, plus one first strike. And lastly, we have our classic and beloved vampire Nighthawk. I will say the all-star in the three drop slot is gonna be Captivating Vampire. Captivating Vampire is one black black for a two two creature vampire. Other vampire creatures you control get plus one plus one. The real blow on this card is the next paragraph. It says tap five untapped vampires you control. Notice that that says tap on the card, which means you can use vampires that have just come out, including himself, to gain control of a target creature. It becomes a vampire in addition to its other types. No matter how many times I've got Captivating Vampire out on the battlefield, I have always had at least five vampires because we are getting more vampires from Edgar Markov. This is an extremely powerful card that can save you in so many situations. It is definitely gonna be the three drop all-star in this slot. Moving on to our four drop vampires, we have Falconrath Noble, which is another Aristocrats vampire. Olivia Voldaren, which is a legendary vampire, which allows us to deal damage and steal opponent's creatures. And then Sanctum Seeker, whenever a vampire you control attacks, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. The, re the reason why I'm reading out the higher costed ones is because they have a lot more powerful effects that we want to pay attention to. The small, the lower costed vampires have a few effects, but we want to spend more time on the, the, the better effects. Now the four drop slot is really important because most of our card draw and our removal spells are going to be around this four drop slot. That's why we don't have very many vampires because we really want to focus on drawing more cards to cast our lower costed vampires to get more vampires. However, Olivia de Valderin is definitely going to be our all-star in this category because she allows us to be able to steal opponent's creatures as well. It does take quite a bit of mana, but you can use that to your advantage by using politics or just by holding people's threats back. In our five mana slot, we have Bishop of Rebirth. When it attacks, you may return target creature card with converted mana cost three or less from a to the battlefield. And with most of our vampires costing less than that, it is gonna be extremely useful to have this card on the battlefield. Blood Baron of Viscopa, which is a 4-4 lifelink protection from white and black that also gets plus six, plus six if an opponent has 10 or less life and you have 30 or more life, which is gonna be very easy with this aggro strategy. Bloodline Necromancer, which is four and a black for a 3-2 lifelink vampire wizard. When it enters the battlefield, you may return target vampire or wizard creature from your graveyard to the battlefield. Just giving us some extra protection from our best vampires that may get removed. Then we have a Bloodlord of Vascoth, which is three black black for a 3-3 vampire warrior with Bloodthirst 3. And Bloodthirst is if an opponent was dealt damage this turn, it enters the battlefield with that many plus one plus one counters. In this case, it is three. It also has flying, and whenever you're cast a vampire creature spell, it gains Bloodthirst 3. Just keep in mind that with Bloodlord of Vascoth, the vampire that is entering the battlefield because of Edgar Markov is not being cast, so it will not gain Bloodthirst 3. And the champion in our five drop slot is gonna be Champion of Dusk. Three black black for a four four vampire knight. When it enters the battlefield, you draw X cards and you lose X life where X is the number of vampires you control. If there is a card that I want to tutor with four runner of the legion, it's definitely gonna be Champion of Dusk because all of our vampires are gonna pretty much be low costed. So we're gonna be pulling out vampires very quickly and our hand is gonna empty pretty fast. So being able to get Champion of the Dusk early so we can fill our hand right after we've played our hand that is going to be how we win the game as quickly and efficiently as possible. And then lastly, we don't have any 6-drop vampires, but I did include the, our 7-drop Butcher of Malakir, which reads, whenever Butcher of Malakir or another creature you control dies, each opponent sacrifices a creature. So those are all the vampires in the deck. Most of those, again, are going to be low-costed because we really want to use the aggressive strategy to our advantage and power out as fast as possible. Now let's go ahead and move on to the Anthem effects, things that additionally help our vampires that aren't necessarily creatures. In this category, I have Icon of Ancestry, which is a three mana artifact that when it enters the battlefield, you choose a creature type, those creatures get plus one plus one, and you can also pay three into it to dig three cards into your library to look for a creature of that type. Obelisk of Erd, which is a six mana artifact with Convoke, which means you can use your vampires to help pay for it. And as it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type, creatures of those types get plus two plus two. 
Etchings of the Chosen, which is one white black for a enchantment. When it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type. Creatures of the Chosen type get plus one plus one. However, you can pay one generic to sacrifice a creature of the chosen color, and another target creature gets indestructible until end of turn. That's going to be really nice when we have our big, powerful anthem effects or zombies out on the battlefield, and you can use your little vampire tokens to give them indestructible to help protect your strategy. Radiant Destiny, which is two and a white for an enchantment with Ascend, which means if you control 10 or more permanents, you get an effect after getting the, if you control 10 or more permanents, you get the city's blessing for the rest of the game and the city's blessing will generally give you an advantage on the card. For this card, it says as it enters the battlefield, choose a creature type, creatures of the chosen type get plus one plus one and you have the, and if you have the city's blessing, they also have vigilance. Stenzia Masquerade, which is two and a red for an enchantment that says attacking creatures you control have first strike, and whenever a vampire you control deals combat damage to a player, you can put a plus one plus one counter on it. And it also has madness for two in red. I would not underestimate this card. It's very powerful because giving our creatures first strike is not only enabling us to be able to take out creatures, but also disincentivizes our opponents from blocking because we're just gonna get rid of them anyway. So that will help assist the idea that we can get more plus one plus one counters on them by dealing damage. Cather's Crusade, which is an enchantment. Whenever a creature enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one plus one counter on each creature you control, which is gonna get way nuts with the amount of vampires that we're putting onto the battlefield. And then lastly, I have Ethria Absolution, which is four white black for a enchantment. Creatures you control get plus one plus one. Creatures your opponents control get minus one minus one. You can also exile a card from an opponent's library. If it was a creature card, you may put a one one white and black spirit creature token with flying onto the battlefield. All right, with that, let's move on to the next category, which is gonna be our card draw, my favorite category. Now, along with the vampires that draw us cards, here are the other effects that are gonna help us draw cards. The all-star in this category is probably gonna be Skull Clamp, which is one generic for an equipment. Equipped creature gets plus one, minus one, and whenever a crypt creature dies, draw two cards and you equip for one. Since our vampires are all coming out as one ones, if we don't have a pump effect, then Skull Clamp is gonna allow us to essentially pay one, sacrifice a vampire to draw two cards, which is gonna be able to fuel our hand and make sure that we always have gas going into this game. We also have Well of Lost Dreams, which is a four mana artifact whenever you gain life you may pay x where x is less than or equal to the amount of life you gained if you do draw x cards now in this deck we do have a lot of ways of gaining life we have some vampires that have lifelink so this is going to help us be able to assure that we take advantage of that lifelink vampiric rites which is a one mana enchantment for one in a black you can sacrifice a creature you gain one life and draw one card damnable pact which is black black x for a sorcery target player draws x card and loses x life keep in mind this says target player so if you have a player that's at seven life and you really can't do anything to get rid of them that turn potentially you could just make him lose seven life and draw seven cards knight's whisper which is one in a black for a sorcery you draw two cards and lose two life ambitions cost which is three in a black for a sorcery you draw three cards and lose three life and Siphon Mine, which is three and a black for a sorcery. Each other player discards a card. You draw a card for each card discarded this way. Along with our other vampires that also allow us to draw cards, this assures that we have at least eight or nine card draw spells in this deck to make sure that we can keep going with our strategy, make sure that we always have something to do, continue with our gas, and close out the game as fast as possible. Moving on to our mana ramp, we have the classic soul ring, uh, the three signets, so that's Boro signet, Demir signet, and Orzov signet in these colors. I have put Ashnod's altar, which is a three mana artifact to sacrifice a creature to add two mana to your mana pool. Bantu's monument, which I'm counting in mana ramp because it's a three mana artifact that says black creatures you control cost one less to cast. It also drains your opponents when you cast a creature. This is, most of our creatures in this deck are black, so this is gonna ensure that we have quite a bit of reduction from our black spells. Black Market, which is three black black for an enchantment. Whenever another creature dies, put a charge counter on Black Market, and at the beginning of your pre-combat main phase, add black to your mana pool for each charge counter on Black Market. And finally, I have Star Compass, which is a two mana artifact that enters tapped, and it adds to your mana pool one mana of any color that a basic land you control could produce. All right, that's gonna be it for the strategy. Let's go ahead and move on to the next step, which is gonna be our interaction. So because we are playing Mardu Colors, we have some of the best spot removal spells in Commander. A lot of these are gonna be ways of being able to remove key permanents and key creatures that are gonna be stopping us from being able to swing out. We don't need very many because we just need to stop the things that are stopping us from being able to aggro our opponents out. In this category, I have Vindicate, which is one white black for a sorcery, destroy target permanent. I have Utter End, which is two white black for an instant that says exile target non-land permanent. 
Return to Dust, which is two white white for an instant that says exile target artifact or enchantment. If you cast a spell during your main phase, you may exile up to one other target artifact or enchantment. Urge to Feed, which is an instant for two black, which says target creature gets minus three, minus three until end of turn. It also has some extra advantage of being able to tap, untap vampires to put plus one, plus one counters on them. And finally, we have New Blood, which is an interesting spell. It's two black black for a sorcery as an additional cost to New Blood. Tap an untapped vampire you control, and then gain control of target creature. Change the tech of that creature by placing all instances of one creature type with vampire. Thematically, this is perfect. And now let's talk about our protection. So our protection, I have included our board wipes in here because really... We don't want to board wipe too many times because we're going to be the ones that have the most creatures that have the most advantage in the first part of the game. But there are a few instances of board wipes that go to our advantage. The first one obviously is Kindred Dominance, which is five black black, choose a creature type, destroy all creatures that aren't that chosen type. Fell the Mighty, which is a sorcery, destroy all creatures with power greater than target creatures power. The thing that we are worried about in this deck is running into creatures that are bigger than ours and slowly losing all of our vampires. But with Fell of the Mighty, we can get rid of all those and assure that the playing field goes in our favor. Vona's Hunger, which is two and a black for an instant with a send. Each opponent sacrifices a creature. If you have the city's blessing and said each opponent sacrifices half the creatures he or she controls, round it up. This card is going to be assuring that if we are playing against another aggro tribal or just creature based strategy that we can level the playing field to give us the advantage again. And lastly on our protection we have Victimize which is two and a black for a sorcery. Choose two target creature cards in your graveyard. Sacrifice your creature if you do return the chosen cards to the battlefield tapped. This just assures that we can have our vampires that maybe do the anthem effects or have a little bit more advantage on them by sacrificing one of our one power vampires. And that's gonna be it for our protection step. So let's go ahead and move on to the reflection period. So obviously with this deck, like I've said, the goal is to play as many small and low costed creatures as fast as possible. And our, our higher drops and our higher drop spells are either gonna pump them, make them better, or give us some more cards. So we're really focusing on having a nice curve. So when you're playing this deck, the hand that you're looking for is something where you can play something on turn one or two, two or three, one and three. You really wanna be able to make sure that you get your vampires out as fast as possible. Never, and I repeat, never keep a hand that you can't play until turn four. You will lose the advantage before you can get it. And also in our reflection period, I wanna talk about why I didn't include very many red spells. Even though red is one of the most aggro strategies out there, with red vampires, they were lackluster compared to the white and black ones. So I included more white and black ones because they assisted the strategy a little bit more. If you wanted to put red into there and maybe try to change it up, make it a little bit more aggro with red spells and go for it, let me know how it does. But for me personally, I just decided to have very few red spells. Third thing I wanted to point out is that the mana ramp in this deck may not be as good as in other decks. And the reason why is because we're so aggressive, we're really focusing on getting our creatures out. So we're gonna have more card draw than we are gonna have mana ramp. Most of our spells are gonna be low casted. Our highest spell in this deck is gonna be seven for board wipes and butcher Malakir. Most of the time you won't even have Edgar Markov when you have the advantage. So that is a reason why I've played less mana ramp spells and I would advise you guys to do the same. If you wanted to play more mana ramp spells and have higher costed vampires, then definitely go for it. I just personally feel like that takes away from the aggro strategy that is gonna make the deck the most efficient. All right, and with that guys, that is it for our Edgar Markov deck. So with that, I'll go ahead and just remind you guys to please like, subscribe, comment on this video telling what you would change, what you like, and definitely check out our Duel of the Peaks episodes that I'm releasing on our YouTube channel. We'll go ahead and link them in the show notes and on the video. And also please go check out our other deck techs that release every Monday. Once again, thank you for tuning in to this Monday's deck tech, and I wish you all a very happy week. May you draw well, may you curve out, and may you always enjoy the games that you play.